Hi, I'm Marita MacDonald from Dentist TV and I'm at the British Dental Association's annual conference and exhibition 2011 in Manchester and I look forward to interviewing some of the speakers, exhibitors and key opinion leaders at the show. I'm speaking with Jodie Bridge, who is the Senior Marketing Manager for Philips Oral Healthcare. Mm -hmm. Jodie, um, so Philips Sonicare has launched two new products here at the BDA conference. Can you tell me a bit about these innovations? Yeah, we're really excited to be here because we're not only launching a new flagship toothbrush called mm -hmm. Diamond Clean, but okay. also a brand new to the world technology in um, our Air Floss product, which okay. is designed to make cleaning between your teeth much, much easier. Okay, so can you tell me a bit more in detail about air floss and how okay. it works? Well, this is it. Okay. Um, as you can see, it's really simple. You literally fill the product with water, mm -hmm. turn it on, and press like with a click of a mouse, literally, and burst of water at 45 wow. miles an hour, takes through and cleans and bursts plaque away from in between your teeth. Oh, okay. Um, and can you give me a bit of insight into how this particular air flask can be used by the dental professional and by patients? Okay. I think it's a commonly understood problem in dentistry that patients don't clean into proximally as much yes. as everybody would like. 56% of households own floss, but actually only between 10 and 40% actually use it. Okay. So what we've done in studies of this is done placement at home with hundreds of consumers, and it's shown that 92% of people that didn't use floss before managed to use it for more than four times a week. So it's really um. providing people an easy way to floss that they can do really regularly. Okay. It takes less than a, hot, less than a minute to do your whole mouth. Wow. All right. And tell me a bit about Diamond Clean. What is it and how does it work? Okay. Well, Diamond Clean that you've got there, yeah. um, incredibly stylish. So it's our slimmest handle to date. Mm -hmm. It's a ceramic finish and it's got an illuminated display. So you toggle through the, minute, the modes that it has, which okay. are five, and it, you choose the one you want. And it's all very stylish, very backlit. But not only does it look really nice, it also has superior plaque removal, so up to 100% plaque removal in hard to reach areas versus a manual toothbrush. Okay. It also has a range of accessories, so that actually glass can also can be used for rinsing, but okay. it's actually the charger as right. well, okay. um, and great. that can sit on your bathroom shelf yeah. um, and charge away. And also we know lots of people revert to a manual toothbrush when they go on holiday, mm. and so we've also designed this travel case, okay. and this, obviously you can put your toothbrush and brush heads in there but it also charges via this and you can charge it from your laptop so we know that now people can actually take yes. their um, rechargeable their sonic air with them on holiday or on business trips fantastic jody can you quickly tell me about the clinical evidence that's been gathered by philip okay. sonic air about these products cool. we've been doing a wealth of clinicals across both and we'll continue to do so mm. um, but for both of them we've looked at plaque removal we've looked at safety mm. to make sure the products are safe and gentle which is really important and then also we've looked at compliance especially on the air floss to know that it's easy to use and people can use it regularly so we have a whole host of clinical data available. Fantastic, thank you very much Jodie. Thank you. I'm speaking with Dr Susie Sanderson who is the chair of the BDA executive board. Susie, this year's BDA dental conference is overshadowed by the amount of red tape that dental professionals have to comply with. What has been your um, sense of what people are talking about on the on the floor as such about what's happening. Well, I've I've taken the advantage of, of having a wander around the exhibition and I've been chairing a session and I've been meeting with colleagues and I have to say that the first thing that they talk to me about is the huge numbers of layers of regulation that we are currently stuck with yes. and they're growing. It's disproportionate. It's often based on a knee-jerk reaction to something that, that should have been dealt with in a different way. Okay. And I am concerned, really, that we are being swamped by this. So, mm. yes, it seems to be the first thing on everybody's minds at the moment. Okay. And so, in that same vein, one of the three, um, three letter words in dentistry is CQC. Mm. Tell me a bit about that and, and what particular comments um, and concerns you've, you've yeah. heard um, about that at this conference? Well, there are two sides to the CQC from the BDA's perspective. Mm. One is that it 
it's one of the things that we're lobbying against. It's a disproportionate, it's a, a duplication of regulation, and it's, in our view, completely unnecessary. It's also being rolled out in the most inept way, and it's causing dentists all sorts of problems. Now, mm. th that's one side, and clearly yeah. it's our role in the, in the British Dental Association to make sure that we are fighting to make sure that whatever regulation is in place is proportionate. On the other side of that, we're also being accused of of supporting that extra layer of regulation by providing dentists with the tools to achieve the, re the regulatory compliance. Now, I, I think we do both very well. We're looking after the dentists in, in making sure that they stay legal, but at the same time, very heavily lobbying against what is a completely unnecessary uh, distraction mm. to providing patient care. And that's really the issue. Dentists are busy doing red tape nonsense instead of getting on with treating patients. Susie, my last question to you is, uh, is another topic that you are associated with, you've taken a prominent role against it, and that is the issue of the doctor title for dentists. Mm. What is the latest update on that and, and what is your position on that? Well, I understand that the, the General Dental Council has, has taken it back to do an impact assessment on the change in that sort of legislation. My own view, and, and I think it's the BDA's view, and it's certainly the view of, of our members from our surveys, is that there is absolutely no point in changing something which has been established successfully following a, cons a consultation several years ago. Uh, it, we are aligned now with our colleagues in Europe. When I go to Europe, and I work quite a lot in Europe, I am Dr Sanderson and everybody knows what that means. My patients know that when I describe myself as Dr Sanderson, dental surgeon, that's what I am. I'm not going to invite them to have their ingrowing toenails or their appendixes done. I am a dentist and it's simply a courtesy title which aligns us with the rest of the dental profession in Europe. And it's a title that we've been using for many years. The GDC allowed us to do that several years ago and this distraction from the GDC to waste enormous amount of time and resources in re-examining is, is a completely pointless exercise. Susie, thank you so much for that. And now, uh, sorry. Any other time? <laughs> <laughs> I'm speaking with Sylvie Sturrock, who is a practice manager for the Neem Tree Group, as well as a consultant for Samira. Sylvie, thank you for joining me. I'd like to ask you, you are presenting on the BDA program. Sure. Tell me a bit about what you're going to be talking about. I'm on a British Dental Practice Managers group stand. There's myself, Mark Oborn, who's the um, social media guru. There's Kate from um, Mint, who's a marketing person. And then there's Amelia Bray, who's the chairman. And we are doing a presentation to a group of 270 people. We've been asked to present ourselves on six slides, which was quite difficult for me. And I've got a 10 minute introduction and then it's um, questions and answers from the group. They can give their answers in before or they can do them live on the day. Okay. And so your topic will be practice, practice management. management. Yes. Okay. And what are the, some of the good things you're going to be talking about and sharing information on? Um, good question. Um, I've given myself three key areas because it's such a short thing. Mm. I can talk normally do a seven hour session on practice management and introduction. So I've done um, three key areas which are finance, team and marketing. Um, I've given um, a list of things that I do and how I do them on a day to day basis running, running my own clinics and running clients clinics and helping them train bespoke training sessions for, that, for them. Okay, so it's very much from your own day-to-day -day yes. experience and many years of experience in yes. practice management. Yes, I think, I think that's the only way to stand in front of people and say, this is what I do, this is how I like it, this is how I think it should be, but every practice is completely different and so what I do on a consultancy basis is go into practice, spend a day walking in their shoes, um, spend some time on reception, listen to the phone calls, sit in the waiting room, hear the patient's feedback, go and speak to the dentist, what's good in the practice, what's bad, and then from that make a report, normally 10 to 12 pages on key functions of the practice and where I feel I can help improve it, and on the back of that, um, how many training sessions and what the training sessions need to cover. Okay, and so people who are going to be part of that audience, 
from your presentation they will gather information about practice management yeah. in terms of... they can of ask anything, absolutely anything. Okay. And when you stand in front of an audience and you ask those sorts of questions, because I remember being in the audience when I was nursing and when I was on reception, you just want, you have got key questions, mm. key problems you have in your practice and there's a person up there that might know an answer and might or might not, but yeah. at least you're the person is there for you to ask and hopefully when they see that on the program they'll understand they can go into that room and ask about marketing, social media or practice management. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sully. Pleasure. I'm here with Dr. James Russell, who is a presenter on the program here at the conference and speaking about clinical photography. James, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you spoke about in your presentation today? Yeah, it's really helping dentists to understand or break down some of the myths about how complicated clinical photography is. It's often talked about as being a very confusing subject, but I was trying to just break down those barriers and make it accessible to everyone to take high quality clinical photographs. Okay, and what are some of the misconceptions in the dental profession about clinical photography? I think a lot of people think that either it's complicated or it's just not necessary or it's not for them or it's more for cosmetic type of procedures, but I think the reality is that Good clinical photography is an essential tool, whether it's for medical legal reasons, whether it's for before and afters, building your own portfolio, posting on Facebook or Twitter. I mean, it's a real, I think it's an essential part of running a contemporary practice. Yeah, okay. And so you also are a British um, an accredited member of the British Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. I am. Um, and what role did clinical photography play in you getting that accreditation? Well, you, you obviously you've got to have the, the dentistry has got to be at a set level but then you've got to be able to show it to the examiners sure. and unless you can take the right photographs you're not going to get through because the whole the whole accreditation process is judged on photographs so your submission is photographic so without the pictures it's not going to happen yeah do you have any advice for any of the dental professionals who are watching this about who want to improve their clinical photography skills that they can do to to get to that level for sure. I mean, the first thing you need to do is really get the right camera. You've got to have a digital SLR camera. Without that, you know, a little point and shoot holiday camera is just not going to work for you. You've got to have the right kit to do the right job. Um, and then you've really got to understand how to, how to use it. So you can go on courses, um, you can read books, but, you know, go and get trained up and then get the right equipment and you're, you're on track. In terms of bringing the skill into the practice and delegating that to other members of staff, um, what do you find is the ideal situation? Um, does it always have to be the dentist that does the photography? How, how does it work? Not at all. If, if the staff are trained properly, it's a really good thing to delegate, actually. And it's something that you'll probably find that one or two members of your staff have a real interest in it and actually really thrive on being able to take the before and after pictures. They're really good at empathising with the patients. They enjoy seeing their journey. So delegating it's great. You know, if someone's not up to the job, then you need to do it yourself. But it's, it's a really good way of getting the team members involved. Fantastic. Thanks for your time, James. It's a pleasure. Thank you. That's it for this show here at the BDA Conference and Exhibition in Manchester. I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Dentist TV.